So I think we're going to move to our second um, scenario now, which is about breaching client confidentiality. And as I said, this was one that was the subject of several questions um, that were submitted in advance of the um, of part one of the webinar. Um, so this case study is done by Johanna Maxwell. Thank you very much, Johanna, for, for doing it for us. She graduated from the Liverpool of University in 2020. And since then, she's worked with the Blue Cross and the Small Animal and enjoys charity and emergency work. So if we could play Johanna's scenario, please, Chloe. Hi, my name's Johanna. I graduated from Liverpool in 2020 um, and I've been working for the Blue Cross, which is an animal charity, mainly based in London, but with a branch in Grimsby uh, since then. So it's a first opinion practice um, and we're seeing clients on benefits mainly, so people that can't afford normal veterinary care. Um, the situation I was going to talk about, I've had quite a few since I graduated. Um, it's been really great, but there's also a lot of challenges that come with it. So one of the ones was I was working last year. So I was out of hours sole charge um, and we had a dog brought in that was unfortunately dead on arrival. My main concern with it when it got here was that it was very emaciated and the owners, the history for it as to why it had died was a little bit vague. It hadn't been, they hadn't sought veterinary care for it in 18 months, as far as we can see. And they confirmed that when we were taking history um, and there was no obvious cause of death other than the fact that it was so skinny. They couldn't really give me any clinical signs or anything that they, you know, that would account for why it had died so suddenly. Um, it was quite a brief handover because unfortunately it was 4 a.m. So the woman was quite upset. So she left and we we took the body in, um, ideally originally for cremation. But then when I was examining it, I did a bit more of a thorough exam and I was a little bit worried about the welfare. With it being out of hours and being the only one there, um, I just popped it on chill for then because I wanted to speak to my more senior colleagues. There was obviously the issue of breaching client confidentiality. But I was also quite concerned that I thought the RSPCA probably should be involved in this case because I didn't think that veterinary care had been sought quickly enough or appropriately. Um, and I was mainly concerned that the welfare needs just hadn't been met. There were another, there was another animal on the file. Um, we weren't sure whether they were still in possession of that or not. But I was a little bit worried as well um, about the care of that animal and kind of safeguarding it going forward. So uh, when the colleagues came in the morning, I had a chat with them um, and my senior vets and my manager, who was really helpful. Uh, she said that I should definitely give the RSPCA a ring. So I spoke to them, um, gave them a bit of a summary, sent them some photos as well. Um, and they agreed that they would want to come and seize it. At that point, I was finishing the shift, so I kind of went home. Um, they'd arranged to seize it the next day. So when they came in, we had a chat with them again. The owners had asked for private cremation, so I did need to call them to let them know what was happening. And I think it was really important to be quite clear that we weren't judging anyone and we just wanted to know what had happened and we were trying to do it for the best interest of the animal. In that case, actually, the owner really responded to that well. And I think I learned that actually, even in difficult communications, I think if you're honest and you're transparent, most of the time, they will be quite reasonable. Not everybody, but I think it does help to, you know, you don't have to call them, but I do think it does help to just explain what's happening. Um, the RSPCA are really, really good as well. They will send someone around to talk to them directly um, and help mitigate that as well. So it kind of makes it a little bit easier for everybody. I didn't call um, VGS or RCVS at the time, but I think in if I had a similar case, especially if maybe I didn't have the senior colleagues around that I did at that time, I would look at maybe getting their opinion um, and their advice just to make sure that breaching confidentiality is something that they kind of support or would agree with in this case. But I think also if you can be quite confident and you can judge your gut if it's if it's something you're worried about, it's something that you can do quite a lot for. Um, and it, it's quite an easy process. The RSPCA are really helpful and there's a lot of support along the way. Okay, so while we were um, having, um, while we were in that video, there was a question in the chat about um, Bolo's scenario, which I'll just jump back to and then we'll have a look at this one. So the question from Laura was, what if there's only one vet on site and a stray animal requires euthanasia ASAP on welfare grounds? Um, and funnily enough, that was exactly a question I was going to come to later because it was one that was submitted in advance of the session. And Laura, maybe it was you that submitted it or maybe somebody else. But um, yes, you can put an animal to to sleep without consent in those um, in those situations. So um, if you look in chapter two of the supporting guidance, um, where it's talking about general veterinary care, um, it says um, that you should obtain the client's consent to treatment unless delay would adversely affect the animal's welfare. So in this case that you're talking about, um, 
you the delay would affect the animal's welfare and so no you don't need consent to do it in that case where you're presented with um, an emergency um obviously you would get consent if from the owner if it's all possible um but if it's if it's a case um like this where you're not sure who the owner is and the delay would cause unnecessary suffering to the animal then you can go ahead without consent on that on those grounds um i hope that that answers your question so moving back from euthanasia into um johanna's scenario about breaking client confidentiality. Um, is this a scenario that any of you have ever been in where you've had to weigh up whether or not to breach client confidentiality? It's one we get asked about often um, at the advice line, kind of that weighing up exercise about, you know, how do you resolve your two obligations, your obligation to maintain client confidentiality and your obligation to um, act in the animal's best interest. And actually, the euthanasia scenario is the same. How do you weigh a with your obligation to only act on informed consent? And often these dilemmas that we see are when two code obligations or two obligations in the supporting guidance are conflicting. Um, so just to let you know if you are ever in this kind of situation you don't have to get permission from the rcbs in order to breach client confidentiality sometimes people think that it's necessary to have our permission to do it it's not we are available to talk you through the guidance and to um kind of help you along the way but ultimately it's, it's your decision to make and if you're satisfied it's justified then then you you can do it and we'll look at the specifics in a moment but just to let you know that you don't have to have um, permission to to do so um can you think of obviously this is the most common so not well, certainly the most common query that we receive in terms of confidentiality where abuse or neglect is suspected but can you think of any other scenarios where you might um where you might be thinking about breaching client confidentiality you can pop it in the chat or you can unmute me that would be nice <laughs> um think of any more it's so difficult isn't it because the obvious one is when there's um abuse or neglect but for example if you suspect that there's um domestic abuse or child abuse going on sometimes you can get a you can get a flavour of what's going on um, and then we have guidance on that um, as well. You can breach client confidentiality. Um, if you if it's a dangerous dog under the Act, then you can breach client confidentiality to let the authorities know. Um, you can do it if in order to prevent and detect crime. There are other um, there are other um, reasons you can do it and they're outlined in our guidance at um, chapter 14. Um, so just having a look at the chat. So Michaela, what are you supposed to do if a new client wants to know um, previous history for an animal previously registered under a previous owner you aren't able to reach? Um, that is a long answer and we have guidance on that um, in uh, the supporting guidance, I think in chapter 14. Um, so I would encourage you to have a look at that chapter because there's a whole flow chart on how you make decisions and it's probably the answer's a bit long for this scenario, but do have a look at chapter 14 and have a look at the flow chart about um, consent and client confidentiality. Um, yes, you can break client confidentiality in the case of notifiable diseases. Although you may necessarily, you may not, you may be able to notify without giving personal details, but if you can't, then yes, you can. I thought GDPR rules only, so Samantha says, I thought GDPR rules only apply to humans and so animal history can be shared. Um, so GDPR does only, um, it does only apply to humans, but in the case of animals, um, it's more to do with client confidentiality and your kind of obligations and your duties as a professional rather than um, rather than um, kind of your, your obligations under GDPR and confidentiality covers um, any clinical information that you have about the about the animal, as well as information you hold about the um, about the owner. Um, and again, there's more about that in um, chapter 40. Uh, okay. So I can take you to 
the code of professional conduct so paragraph 2.6 um, veterinary surgeons must not disclose information about a client or the client's animals to a third party unless the client gives permission or animal welfare or the public interest may be compromised so you can see there Samantha that the obligation makes reference to um, information about the client's animals as well as um, about the client so definitely covered under the code um, and then moving on to um, the supporting guidance sorry um it, there's a lot of information in the supporting guidance about um what to do where you need to breach client confidentiality or you need to give you need to pass on details but there's not consent so um if consent is refused or seeking consent would undermine the purpose of the disclosure for example so you're trying to protect the animal and you're worried that if you tell them you're going to do that something might happen or they might become uncontactable or whatever it is um, you will have to decide whether the disclosure can be justified um, and the more animal welfare or public interest is compromised then the more prepared a veterinary surgeon or veterinary nurse should be to release the information to the relevant authority and the relevant authorities are for example the RSPCA the police um, and, and such like. Um, each case should be determined on the particular circumstances and if there's any doubt about whether the disclosure without consent is justified, the issue should be discussed with an experienced colleague in practice before the information is released. So talk it through with somebody who is experienced and senior who can talk you through it or give us a ring um, or do both. Um, just get as much kind of input as you can before you make that decision so that you know your um, you know that you're kind of really justified in doing it um and you should be as as the next part of the code 1410 says you should be prepared to justify your decision and any action taken um, and ensure that you make a really good note of what you've done and why you've done it and who you've spoken to about it in order to reach your decision so that if anything happens you've got that there um to kind of um refer to if necessary um so there's as I say, there is so much information in chapter 14, so please do go and have a look at it. Um, uh, but the last thing I just wanted to draw your attention to is paragraph 1416, where it should only, the decision to breach client confidentiality should only be taken when the veterinary surgeon or veterinary nurse considers on reasonable grounds that an animal shows signs of abuse or is at real and immediate risk of abuse in effect by the public interest in in protecting an animal overrides the professional obligation to maintain client confidentiality and the legitimate interest in disclosing the client's personal data overrides the client's rights rights to the protection of his or her personal data so that's the kind of weighing up exercise that you have to do and as i say you can talk it through or you can call us to kind of help um, navigate this um, very difficult issue and um, the other thing to say is in johanna's case i wondered if you thought it was significant that the animal was no longer alive as opposed to a living animal do you think that's significant when you're deciding whether to breach client confidentiality this scenario as well was interesting because the um owner had there was another as johanna said there was another animal on the file um, and so the risk was not only so even though the animal who was brought in was deceased um, and so was no longer at risk in that sense, um, there was still a risk to the other animal that, that was on file. Um, and so, you know, there, there was ongoing risk. Um, so that's significant in this case as well. Okay, so if we know more questions about Johanna's case or breaching client confidentiality, you can always pop them in the chat at any time and I'll try and come to them if you, you think of it later. Um, I think we're going to do another quick, shall we do the, another quick quiz, Emma? Yeah, I'm, not I'm working. ready to launch. Oh, okay. Yeah. Emma's going to launch. Let's see what happens. <laughs> okay. So the first question, um, so we're going to do another quick fire, um, true or false. Um, sorry, before I answer that, I can see Fabian's asked the question, what about controlled diseases where there is a risk to the national herd? How does one do that? There's a whole process for notifiable diseases through APHA, so the Animal and Plant Health Agency. Um, you can go onto their website and you can, um, you can find out more about that from them. There is also a section in our guidance about notifiable diseases, but I have to say off the top of my head, I can't remember which chapter it is. While we're watching the next video, Fabian, I will check for you and I'll let you know where to find it in our guidance so you can can have a look um i'll just make a quick note 
of that. Okay, so we're going to do the icebreaker quiz again um, about the true or false. So let's see if we can get it to work. Um, so first one is veterinary surgeons must ensure that their professional activities are covered by indemnity insurance. Is that true or false? Everyone has said true, Gemma. Yes, that is true. Good. Oh. <laughs> and you all have it, I'm sure. <laughs> and the next, the next one, one is, yeah. yeah, is veterinary nurse. So true or false, veterinary nurses working under the direction of a veterinary surgeon may carry out minor surgery. Is that true or false? Just a few more coming in, Gemma. That's right. So 60% said true and 40% said false. That is true. Veterinary nurses may carry out minor surgery if working under the direction of a veterinary surgeon. Um, there are certain other requirements. So the, obviously the, the RVN has to be competent to do it. The veterinary surgeon has to be satisfied that they're competent to do it um, and, and so on. And there's lots about um, responsible delegation in our guidance. Um, but yes, um, the veterinary surgeon's access, uh, yes, a veterinary nurse working under direction can carry out minor surgery. Uh, next one. So a request for a referral should be facilitated, but there is no requirement to facilitate requests for a second opinion. True or false? Thirty-six percent true and sixty-four percent false. Yep, yeah, that one's false. There is also a requirement to facilitate requests for a second opinion. And if you look at the referrals and opinions chapter, which I think is chapter one, I think it's the very first line. So, um, yeah, that one's definitely true. Uh, sorry, that one's definitely false. Uh, well, there's a question in the chat box, Gemma from Georgina. Okay, from Georgina. When talking about a case to a colleague from your own practice or another practice, e.g. informal advice over the phone, or you're presenting a webinar, et cetera, e.g. The, the, the vets from the videos from this session, what aren't you allowed to say? What do you don't you need permission for? So I think a good rule of thumb is that you don't need to give any, in a situation, so in this webinar, you're giving kind of very anonymized information it's not possible to identify the animal it's not possible to identify um the owners and they're not giving any identical and sorry any identifiable information and that's what's crucial about confidentiality um hypothetical scenarios or kind of situations where none of that information is given are acceptable and a thing where you give any detail so for example when you make a welfare report to the RSPCA they obviously need to know who you think is who you suspect is um, abusing or neglecting an animal so that does constitute a breach of client confidentiality but in this webinar for example where the vets are talking about cases where there's no identifiable data and nobody knows who they're talking about then that is acceptable um, hopefully that answers your question 